first thing I want to talk about is, of course, you were born in Montreal, but you went to Ryerson to do your journalism. Uh, why Ryerson? Uh, I was born in Montreal, but I grew up in Toronto. So from age one until I went to, until I sort of graduated from Ryerson, because I was short one credit, actually, when I left Ryerson after three years. But I'm I'm a Toronto girl and went to high school and public school and everything in Toronto and then took journalism at Ryerson and, and then moved to Montreal for a summer job, not speaking any French or knowing anything about uh, Quebec politics or anything, but I, it sounded exciting. So the summer job there turned into a full-time job that turned into lots of different jobs over the years. And if you don't mind saying, what was that uh, summer job? It was for CFCF, which is the Montreal affiliate of CTV, and it was just to be a, a local reporter, and uh, that was in 1979, and it was just before the first referendum on Quebec sovereignty, and anyway, I was offered, I grew up listening to CBC Radio, but at the end of Ryerson, I got offered summer jobs with a couple of their affiliates, too, but uh, the CTV affiliate was in Montreal, and I thought it would be like being a foreign correspondent without actually having to leave the country. So I went there, and it took me took me a while to learn how to speak French, but my part-time job took turned into a full-time job, and then I ended up at the Quebec legislature with CBC years later, and I, it was a fascinating time. The 80s, the early 80s in, uh, in Quebec were uh, a very, very passionate, provocative, fascinating time to be a, a, a young reporter. And what was it like, just the atmosphere? Because I'm guessing you got this job right out of graduation? I didn't graduate, but uh, but I left Ryerson with 31 out of 32 credits because I had a job. And yeah, no, it was fascinating. It was terrifying, actually, because the referendum, the, the first Quebec referendum happened like within a year of my arriving in Quebec, and I barely spoke French. They sent me out onto the streets with a camera to gather some like street cover, and there was a riot when the Yes Side lost. And and uh, there I am on the eastern edge of town where hardly anyone speaks English. And I'm barely beyond Je m'appelle Wendy <laughs> covering the riots as they were sort of storming down St. Catherine Street and breaking windows and so on. And I was just like, I hope nobody catches on to the fact that not only am I uh, an Anglo from Toronto, but I don't really speak any French. So it was, uh, it was very exciting. But I worked really hard to learn the language and I ended up moving to Quebec City. And by the time I, I left, I was dreaming in French. And this is interesting because I want to mention this because, you know, in, in today's world with the 20 year olds that are graduating now, we can't really find a way to get our foot in the door without knowing if we wanted to go to Montreal or Quebec, we've got to know French or in the case of broadcast journalism, you have to have that degree or diploma or some kind of credibility. So do you think that that's better off now in the world that people have the degree and credibility or do you kind of think if you have the talent, just hire the person? I think it's really tough to start out in journalism these days. I mean, there's there's some areas that are a lot easier in terms of social media. You don't actually have to go and work for a big network anymore to get your voice out there. But, of course, starting out on your own and hoping that somebody will follow you enough that you'll be able to turn that into some kind of career is, is a pretty scary prospect. So when I started out a thousand years ago, journalism was way bigger. Sort of mainstream journalism was way bigger than it is. There were so many more jobs available now newspapers are shrinking and CBC has shrunk and so have all the networks so I, I, I do I think it's uh, it's terrifying whether you have a, a degree or you speak French or not it, it's really 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 hard but on the other hand you know I, I know all kinds of people who are blogging and have Instagram accounts and are doing all kinds of wonderful like I, I wish that I had had more freedom there was really not very many different kinds of journalism that were seen as respectable when I was starting out there was there was only kind of the straight kind and now some of the best journalism is done on the comedy shows so it, it's a wider world but it's narrower and it's a lot scarier speaking of that just the tv shows that do the comedy do you watch like the john olivers the rick mercers and the colbert's as well uh, I sure do. I think John Oliver is probably the best journalist working in television right now. I think he's fabulous. He has a week and 40 producers and writers, and he hires more journalists than he hires comedy writers, and they take very serious issues and make people focus on them and have a few laughs. I think he's I think he's amazing. I love John Oliver as well, but one thing that I kind of I like that you do with interviews is you interviewed Colin Mockery's daughter not that long ago and I really liked how you handled 
the interview as well because you know transgender and all that is uh, it's it's new to the world and accepting it so i just wanted to give you a bit of credit on that one as well Oh, thanks. Uh, I'm a politics groupie, but also a bit of a comedy groupie. And so I think Colin Mockery is amazing. And then I read about his daughter and thought that would be a really cool interview. And I decided instead of doing an interview asking her how hard it was to be trans and how horrible life might have been or still can be for her, to do that interview more as a love story and about the love between them and how they're trying to be supportive of each other and they're succeeding. And that isn't that cool. So I, I tried to do it as a positive story. And the one thing that I'm going to just, because you did mention you like comedy, we noticed in Newfoundland when we watch it, because I go home for the summer, my dad is a very big fan of CBC. He loves watching The National. He's after putting out to a few times to me, he's like, why don't you be like a Peter Mansbridge or Wendy Messley? And I'm like, dad, everyone has their own characteristics. But uh, we, he kind of gets a kick out of it of when he turns on the TV and Peter's not there that night, it'd be like um, when you introduce yourself it says like Peter's away tonight. Uh, you know this is the national with men with uh, Wendy Mesley, and my dad just goes like, if there's anyone that's going to replace Peter, it's going to be her. And uh, if they did come to you and gave you that job, uh, would it be like a stepping stone for you and women in media? Oh, there's lots of women who are doing really well. Uh, both of the other networks are uh, Global and CTV. Their their anchors are both women. So it's uh, I think there's been a massive change in how uh, women have have pushed ahead. When when I first started out, I started uh, at a radio station when I was in high school, answering phones, and then they let me do bits and pieces when the guys didn't show up for work occasionally. Back then, and we're talking about the late 70s, the line was that, of course, there's no women in news because women's voices aren't authoritative authoritative enough and I was like well of course not if you've never heard a woman's voice deliver the news or do an interview with anyone serious so things have changed so much so I don't I don't think that we that women have to really complain about our position in the news business anymore most of the foreign correspondents for CBC right now maybe not most but at least half of them are women so we've we've broken through half of the vice presidents at CBC are are women we've never had a female president but i'm sure that'll happen <laughs> in the next uh, few years yeah we're we're doing pretty well would you run for the president of the company no no i would never <laughs> want to run for any political job. I love being a reporter and a journalist. And, you know, I've been asked by parties over the years, do you want to run for office? I'm like, no, it's way more fun on this side. What makes it interesting to you? Journalism? Yes. Well, I spent decades in the field as a reporter. And at some point in there, I think they realized that there weren't very many women in senior positions on the air. And so they kept coming to me to say, hey, do you want to uh, be an anchor? Do you want to be a local anchor? Do you want to host a show? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? I even got approached by one of the sports networks, believe it or not. I have absolutely no knowledge about male team sports. And uh, and I kept saying no, because I loved being in the field. I loved, in those days, there were enough resources that I was able to head out with a, a camera person in the morning and go off and interview people and shoot all the pictures and figure out what the story was and come back with something original now because there are there's so little money in journalism and because there's so much pressure to be tweeting or on Newsnet basically updating your story all day long, uh, you don't really have enough time to follow stories the way that I was able to when I was starting out. So I loved I loved being a reporter and being able to come up with an idea for a story and present it and chase it down and write it and tell it. And then I started doing investigative stuff. I did a show called Undercurrents for five or six years. It was my favorite. It was about media and technology and basically uh, how we get uh, spun by corporations, by media, by everybody. And then the last few years, I do bits and pieces of long stories and lots of interviews and some panels and anchoring the national and it just makes my life a little bit more reliable I don't wake up every morning going oh my god where am I going today what fresh disaster will I be chasing um, I know that I'm going to be at the office and it could be a crazy day it could be a long day like a couple of weeks ago when uh, Trump decided to launch those missiles against Syria uh, in retaliation for the, the chemical attack and we did I basically ad libbed four hours or five hours of news programming. So it, it gets pretty exciting in a studio too, but everything is, I, I just, I, I like being, I like being part of the moment. I like being part of what's happening in the world. And if you don't mind me asking, of course, you kind of told us how you got to CBC a little bit earlier, but do you mind explaining how you got the, the anchor, co-anchor job for the National? 
Well, I was a reporter in Montreal and Quebec City covering local politics and provincial politics for almost 10 years. And then I was a national reporter. Actually, I was the first woman covering the prime minister for the national and for CBC. So I worked in Ottawa for in the parliamentary bureau for about five years. And then I came to Toronto and did a show called Undercurrents for six years, which was investigative and anchored that. And during that period, they asked me, I know I used to do a version of the sort of at issue panel where I was one of the commentators as opposed to the person doing the um, uh, doing the Peter role. So learning all kinds of different things and different skills and during the period that I was doing undercurrents and then over into when I was the co-host of Marketplace, which I did for five or six years, they asked if I wanted to anchor. So I've been anchoring for, oh my God, probably uh, 25 years now. Yeah, I started doing Sundays about 25 years ago, and then the last five or six years or whatever, I've been doing Fridays as well as Sundays. And so it just, you know, you you work your way up the greasy pole, and you pay your dues, and you work like a dog, and, um, and you learn a few things along the way. And so, yeah. What are some of your favorite interviews, or who are some of the people that you like to interview the most? Well, I spent most of my career interviewing politicians. Um, I loved, I, I covered the separatist, René Lévesque, when he was premier um, a thousand years ago in Quebec City. I loved covering him because he was probably the only politician I've ever covered, including a whole bunch of prime ministers like Brian Mulroney and Jean Chrétien and Stephen Harper, who wasn't either intimidated or impressed by uh, reporters. He used to be one, so he kind of felt at home with us, and it was uh, days before the uh, PR people, kind of communications people, took over and told them what to say and to come up with um, communication strategies. So he talked to us like we were real people, and he'd get mad, and he'd get rude, and he'd engage in debate, but you always felt like you were having a real conversation. So I, I moved to Ottawa after that, and I sort of joke that I never had a real conversation with a camera rolling, with a camera, with a uh, with a politician ever again. Um, so yeah, so most of my interviews have been what would be called accountability interviews, where you're asking somebody about an issue of a day of the day, and in investigative reporting, uh, particularly at Marketplace, we would do a lot of research and make the case that uh, somebody or some company was uh, doing Canadians wrong, and then I would go and interview them, either jumping out of a, a out of a van and <laughs> asking them questions when they refused to give us an interview, or sort of doing sit down interviews with people about serious issues of the day, and I really like that. I mean, and it does get your adrenaline running because you have to really be on your toes and be prepared for you know them to say something that you're not expecting. But in the last little while for uh, the Sunday night interviews, I've been doing more celebrities and comedians. And last week we did an interview with Harder Ryan Singh, who does uh, Hockey Night in Canada Punjabi version, just about what a difference that's made in his community. Of, and now the people in the Sikh community are I have become huge lovers of hockey. So that was fun. I, I like doing sort of, uh, and you mentioned the one with Colin Mockery and his daughter. I like, I like doing this sort of softer, warmer interviews just as much as I like doing the uh, the trickier, hard interviews. And you've been doing, like you said, The National for a long time now, um, but do you still get a little bit stressed out or is it still like exciting to you going in each day and doing breaking stories or is it kind of now become mundane or just a, an ordinary everyday thing? Uh, we plan the show, like we start to the first the conference call is at 9 o'clock in the morning where we figure out how to assign everybody and what are the stories that we think are the most important for the day. And then there's another meeting at noon where we discuss, okay, what changes have come along? Which direction should we go in? What did we mess up last night? What do we need to push for tonight? And then the scripts c- come in. And so as an anchor, you see all of the work building during the day and you contribute to it. And there's all kinds of arguments and so on about what the story should be or what the lead should be or more of this, less of that. So you're very involved involved during the day, so you have a pretty good idea. You have a very good idea because most of it is scripted. When you go into the studio, you know what's going to happen. So I don't really get nervous about shows in, in general anymore, but where it does get exciting is when you hear, as we did a few weeks ago at 8.47, and we go live to the Maritimes at 9 o'clock, that Trump had just launched these missiles on Syria, and we had no reporters, and we had nothing written, and like that's 
very exciting. So I'm on the wires and I'm on Twitter and I'm trying to figure out what it, and then there's no script and I'm just winging it. And then they go on my ear, okay, we've got Paul Hunter in Washington and we're hoping to get to Lindsay Duncombe down in Mar-a-Lago and we'll try and get some experts in, but uh, just tap dance for now. We'll be <laughs> back soon. So that's exciting. The other nights that really terrify me are election night because obviously you don't know what's going to happen. So for the last 10 elections or so, I've been responsible for the results from Quebec, which means that I have to know the history, the background of all of the candidates and who's likely to win and what are some interesting anecdotes and what is the relative importance of each area for all of the ridings in all of Quebec. Um, and sometimes they have other provinces that I'm responsible for too. But I don't know, as the news is breaking and the results are coming in, I don't know of all that information, what am I going to need? So I have to have it all in my head. So it's terrifying. It's like you're studying for a hundred exams, but you'll actually only be asked one exam's worth. <laughs> so those are, uh, and and you have to be able to talk to all the whizzing and blurring graphics that are flying by too. And I don't do that as often as, uh, you know, the people on CNN. So it's fun in a sort of terrifying way. But you make it look like you're so calm on the air that no one no one notices it. So it, it works out. Yeah, it's uh, it's it gets better over the years. <laughs> and of course, now the, what I want to mention too is in 2005 you were diagnosed with breast cancer. How did you take that news, and how are things now? Uh, as far as I know, I'm fine until I you know die of something else. But yeah, it was uh, it was pretty shocking, except that I was very lucky and that they found it early. So I decided to live in denial and go through a year of uh, crap of, you know, the treatments are pretty brutal. Um, but I never really thought I was going to die. And there's, there's two worlds in cancer land. There's the people who think they're going to live and the people who are afraid they're going to die. And I never really accepted the premise that I could die. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm pretty lucky. It and was, uh, it was crappy, but it could have been a lot worse. And I'm guessing through all this, you kind of had your own documentary, that the Chasing the Cancer Answer. Yeah, which was, I didn't want to do one of those, oh, here I am getting my chemo, what was me, why Why me? It was, um, that didn't feel right for a journalist to do. And so the, the, the premise of that documentary was, why not me? Because I was so shocked to figure out why it was so common that one in eight or one in nine women will get breast cancer at some point in their life. And that the uh, same thing for men and prostate cancer. And that in the case of breast cancer, about 90, 95 percent of them are not they're, they're not genetic like people would say oh does it run in your family well in most people's families there's nothing or most breast cancers it has nothing to do with your family it has to do with what you're exposed to at some point in your life so that documentary was to say could we please pay a little bit more attention to prevention because we know there's lots of things that cause cancer and we're suspicious about a lot more things and could you please let me know you know like people don't know most people don't know or at least the point I did the documentary didn't know that alcohol is a carcinogen the, the birth control is a carcinogen and that, you know, let people figure out, uh, let people know what increases their odds of having cancer and let them choose their poisons. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. Like, I, I remember um, when I first heard about uh, you being diagnosed with cancer and then chasing the cancer answer and you just tell, telling me, like, instead of saying, like, why me, why not me? It's just a different approach. And I really like that your answer you gave there that, you know, even as a journalist, you thought, We'll do it this way rather than being about kind of yourself in a way. Yeah, no, I tried to make it not about me. And, you know, things are, there's been more, not because of the documentary, but just I think people are increasingly aware of sort of environmental exposures these days, which is good. Now, in Canada, like you mentioned earlier, you have Global TV, CTV, and CBC all have women as their anchors. You mentioned about how many women are employed with CBC, but there's a statistic that said here that women are on camera on 32% of the time. So... Uh, it says the news industry still hasn't achieved that gender equality. Do you think that's safe to say, or do you feel like in Canada it's a little bit better? I think in Canada, we've, uh, if you watch the, the major networks, I think women are doing really, really well. It certainly wasn't like that when I started out, but there's been huge strides made. And I, uh, I yeah, I don't know what the numbers are. I'm not sure what, which uh, study you're referring to, but I, I, I think we've made great strides. And they also said in this article, too, that uh, opinions are mostly male. They said that in a newsroom or in a opinion piece on newspapers in a room, it's like, I think it was 7-4 the ratio or 7-3 in terms of writers. Do you agree with that, that opinions are mostly male? 
I haven't done a study, and I know that on our panel on Sunday, we haven't had any trouble finding lots of uh, opinionated women. I think it's, you know, in my lifetime, I think there's been a lot of change where I remember people telling me when I was starting out that I was mouthy and ambitious and Mm -hmm. whatever, and that that wasn't appropriate, or at least not what was expected from a woman, but I don't think that's really the case anymore. I think we're moving to a place where most people are comfortable with uh, women being as mouthy as men. Yeah, so (laughs) you're you're basically... There's basically a fair opportunity in the field for both male and females. Yeah, I think so. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of um, of, uh, older people who um, may not be as comfortable with that, but uh, it takes time to change things. So it's uh, I think we've made uh, great progress. That's going to do it for this episode of Tobin Tonight. Our thanks to Wendy Mesley for coming on the show. Remember, you can find past, present, and future episodes on TobitTonight.com, Spotify, and iTunes. Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and leave a comment or two. For Tobin and myself, this is Jacob saying, thanks for listening, and good night.